Okay, so we now have <laughs> a really good uh, session with uh, panelists, and I'll introduce myself and my fellow panelists in a moment, and then we're going to have some uh, some pitches from, from from people from around the world, actually. So um, I would urge you to make the most use of it in terms of the Q and A. Unfortunately, Ulrich Betts cannot be here; he is ill, and I'm a bit croaky because I'm recovering from something. So uh, apologies for that. So my name is Jackie Hunter. Uh, I have worked in Big Pharma. Uh, I'm, I'm running both research and development activities. I spent three years uh, running an open innovation consultancy and uh, trying to spin assets out of pharma. We could touch on some of the learnings from that uh, at some point. And uh, then I was head of one of the research councils for the UK. And now I'm uh, heading up a company that is bringing artificial intelligence and biomedical discovery together. I'd now like to introduce Virginia Atcher. Uh, and Virginia is di um, Executive Director of Research, um, Med Medical and Innovation for the e ABPI. And so essentially, she's really responsible for driving the sort of pharmaceutical innovation agenda in the UK forward. Prior to that, she was at Amgen, and uh, where she was Director in the Global Regulatory and Policy Division, looking after Africa, Europe and um, the Middle East. Uh, she is chair of the Pharmacovigilance uh, Working Group for the International um, Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturer Associations. She's been on other important committees. Formerly, she was with Pfizer for five years, and then in her academic life, uh, she had positions at Imperial, at the Science Policy Unit at Sussex, and at the London Business School, and she is visiting researcher in innovation and entrepreneurship at Imperial's um, Business School. So, very experienced <laughs> person there. And of course, I'm probably, Sir Greg Winter does not need any introduction, but I will introduce him anyway, because he, basically, the technology that he developed, uh, really, even now, is still an integral part for only over 60% of the antibody therapeutics that are currently in use today. Uh, and in recognition of his um, fantastic contribution, he received the MRC Millennium Medal in 2013, which is only given to those people who have really accomplished significant social, economic, or health achievements. More importantly for this discussion, he is one of the few serial entrepreneurs in the UK. Uh, he founded Cambridge Antibody Technologies in 1989, which was sold to AstraZeneca for £700 million. He then co-founded Demantis, and I know many people from there because GlaxoSmithKline, my old company, bought um, Demantis for £230 million. And in 2009, established Bicycle Therapeutics. One of the major contributions is not only um, the formation of the companies and what they've done, but it's also generating people who are entrepreneurs in themselves and funding uh, business angels like Andy Richards, etc. And through the money that the MRC gained from his, his, um, his uh, activities, actually over £400 million has gone back into the research ecosystem. So Sir Greg has had a profound effect, I think, on the, the research and innovation ecosystem. So um, I'm very pleased that he's on the panel. So I'll give a, <coughs> a few uh, introductory comments, and then I will ask my fellow panellists to... Um, I'm being very low-tech because my computer had a meltdown. So I was being very high-tech and writing my notes on my computer, but it died on the way here, so I'm low-tech. Uh, I think that there are three things that are fundamental to fostering a research and innovation ecosystem. The first is you've got to have the ideas. You've got to have the right ideas, the right concepts. The second is that you have to have the right human capital. You have to have the right people. And the last is to have the right environment, infrastructure, and, and funding. We'll touch a bit on funding. There's another session on funding later. <clears throat> now, my perspective is that in the UK, there is no shortage of ideas. We have the top university, you know, three of the top universities in the world. We have a second in the innovation index, only to the USA. Uh, our papers are... 16% of, of, uh, of the world's most cited research papers have originated from the UK. So we have the right ideas. Do we have the right people? Well, if we look at, <coughs> at a different sector, at IT, 
There is tremendous entrepreneurship in the UK. Um, SwiftKey, DeepMind, the most promising entrepreneurs in this area um, you know, are men and women under 21. So there is an environment in the UK that stimulates innovation. Why doesn't that happen <coughs> to the extent we would like to see in the biomedical sphere? Is it because there's something different about the way academia or uh, the other aspects of the environment treat biomedical research? Is it because translating biomedical research is much riskier and uh, therefore needs more cash and has to be more risk tolerant? Uh, these are some interesting questions I think we could, we could ponder on. And lastly, I think we, we really need to focus on having people who can straddle, I think was touched on by the previous speaker, more than one domain, more than just biology, who can look at the interface between digital and uh, bioscience, basic bioscience, and how can we foster that? Now, in terms of the right, uh, oh, and one thing I will say that was very, has been very promising that the BBSRC, my former organisation, sponsored was a young entrepreneur scheme, the, the Biotech Yes scheme, which was run with NERC and the University of Nottingham. And that really kind of has, is a competition across the country for teams to come get together to formulate a business plan for a theoretical product, although many of them were so exciting I wish they were real, uh, and culminates in a final uh, which is held in the, London at the end of the year. And that competition is actually open at the moment. What the BBSRC also did in terms of fostering the right environment was uh, to create a number of schemes that would help bring academia and industry together, such as industrial partnership awards, link schemes, um, and uh, research and industry clubs. The BBSRC and the other research councils are involved in working with Innovate UK to create catalysts. Uh, the biomedical catalyst, the industrial biotechnology catalyst, and the agritech catalyst, which are really looking at translating across that valley of death. These schemes are really important, and I think it's important that government is seen to be engaging. Why is that important? Because globally, somebody was here from Singapore. I've worked in Singapore. The Singapore government are very, very engaged in terms of stimulating uh, translation of basic research. We need to have the right environment in terms of funding. Um, BBSRC had its own seed fund. Uh, I know that when I was trying to spin assets out of Big Pharma, I found it impossible to get UK funding, but I got engagement in Europe and the US. What can we do to stimulate funding environment in the UK from venture funding? My current company and companies like Oxford Nanopore are equity funded and that gives a more long-term um, and, and a different value proposition. So I think we have to look at how we incentivize people to invest in the UK, uh, in, in, in companies. A couple of other things I want to mention, predictability. One of the things I found when I was trying to spin assets out is if there was no clear regulatory path, so something for an unmet medical need where there was no path uh, to, 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 to file, no clear endpoints, no commitment to purchase, for example, in other areas within the NHS. That makes it very hard for investors to invest. We have to think about how we make the environment more predictable and less risky. There are some things we can't control, but there are other things we can control, and we should seriously consider that, both within the UK and within Europe. And risks, where are the risks? Well, for many uh, in investors, pharmaceutical, the biomedical sphere, is highly risky. Many people within the industry have never worked on, a reg uh, on an approved compound. I'm lucky I have worked on several, but for many, they, ha they, they have not worked in that area. Um, if we look at other areas of biotechnology, in, uh, for example, in, 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 in agriculture, plant health, and industrial biotechnology, there are still risks, but they are somewhat, somewhat less. Uh, there, many of the risks are around the commercialization. And so I mentioned government support is a risk. The last thing I'd like to say is, is, and it's a bit of a challenge to the pharmaceutical industry, I spent a lot of time trying to spin assets out. One of the, and it, it's quite hard, and I call it fear of success, because suddenly anything that goes out and can raise venture capital money is going to be successful, and that could be an embarrassment to the company if they actually spin it out. I might be being a bit harsh here, but... 
Uh, I'm being trying to be a bit provocative for the discussion. Uh, in Switzerland, the environment of a biotech was really stimulated by a few companies actually spinning assets out and creating companies like Actillion. Can we do this in the UK? Can we do this more globally? And I think if you look at other sectors such as consumer, they've been very good at not only bringing things in, but also pushing things out. So there are a few areas there I think that we could be open up for, for discussion. And um, uh, you know, I, I think we, we're, we're on for a very promising session. So I'm going to finish my, my, my talk on time, and I will now hand over to Virginia. Well, thank you, and good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here, and especially on, on uh, panel and following such an excellent talk. I feel like you're going to hear uh, me repeat a couple of those points. So um, Jackie gave you an illustration of my rather odd background. So my, my academic training is uh, I'm an economist, um, even from this university. And I have uh, since become a science policy, PhD, uh, and then moved into pharma. So I have a bias towards wanting to understand social systems as much as I want to understand how the medicines we make are going to make a difference to patients. So I'm going to come back to that story a bit. One of the questions that we were set was, um, you know, what biggest gaps do we see in biotech research and innovation up to 2050? Uh, I don't think that's a crazy length of time. I think, um, if anything, what Sophie's uh, slide showed you with the pattern of change is that it's usually a lot longer than we want it to be. So when we call about a cancer on, uh, a war on cancer in 1970s and we get a bit despondent by 1990, it's because we were expecting things a little bit sooner than they should. Uh, the first immunotherapy work was back in 1891. Um, so science doesn't always move at a pace that we want it to. But where I think the general tra trajectory is, I think everybody's agreed, we're trying to understand uh, human biology and disease biology in such a way that we can get to predictability so that I can understand what I might do might make a difference. Uh, to help patients and, and in ways that, you know, we see in other areas of science with some envy. I, I don't have laws that I can rely on. Um, that's why I have to rely on the work that we do and the way we've structured the scientific approach we've taken reflects that process. As science progresses, I suspect that will change. Will that affect the way the industry is structured? In, undoubtedly. Um, it already is. I mean, to some extent, the way we recruit people these days looks a lot different than it did 10, 15 years ago. We are looking for cross-disciplinarity. We are looking for people with multiple skill sets. Um, bioinformatics isn't just even a single skill set in itself now. People are looking for combinations of what else do you have with that. Uh, and it's because we know that that's, that convergence is where that innovation is really going to be exciting. Um, the question I have is, is that going to happen here in the UK? I take a deep personal interest in it because uh, it, it's partially on my head to make sure that the UK um, gets the most out of our industry and vice versa uh, in terms of advancing the science. And that's something that um, <coughs> has been a question for many, uh, many since I started pharma. Um, they've always been saying, you know, the, the R&D model is broken, uh, the drug discovery model is broken. Well, I, I have a problem with that conversation because of uh, the several points. So broken, what do we mean by broken? Um, what we probably mean is, is it fit for purpose or is it fit to the environment or the scientific opportunity that we have? There's no doubt that's been changing. It's been evolving. And it's maybe hopeful uh, at present that it's looking like it's having some uh, impact. I think last year in the FDA count, we were at the, a high water mark of 45 uh, new molecular entities, uh, BLAs approved. Of those, 21 were for rare disease and 17, or sorry, 16 were first in class. Uh, the famous first-in-class uh, initiatives. Also, critically, uh, about uh, 27 of those were done through expedited measures, so through breakthrough therapies, through um, accelerated access, something of that sort. So it's also telling, it's not only companies have changed in the way they do the models, the regulators are also trying to be responsive to what the science will allow. So things are definitely changing. The question will be, um, you know, what long-term progress that will really achieve. It's not just about how many uh, new molecular entities you, you approve. It's whether it makes a difference for a patient or to people live longer. Does, does this make any real impact in terms of final outcomes in, in healthcare? Um, and that's obviously something that, you know, not just the regulators are interested, but the HTA bodies are interested, health technology uh, authorities that are, are assessing these different uh, uh, molecules as they go through. 
I also have a problem with that phrase, um, R&D models are broken, is that it assumes there's one. There isn't ever one. Um, I have um, looked at many sectors, many industries, there's, there's never a, a single approach. In fact, that's usually the competitive advantage of a company. It's the way it's framed, how it's going to do its technology search. A lot of it has to do with the history of the company, um, how the company leadership moves, but it's also uh, probably reflective of the environment in which they have been most active, and that may be choice of therapy area in our, in our world of medicines, and it may be also the environments in which they found. Um, my, my team um, at ABPI make fun of me because I don't like the word ecosystem. I refuse to use it if I can avoid it because it makes it sound too much like things will happen. If you get the initial conditions or the supporting conditions right, everything happens. I think that ignores people far too much. Um, so there's something about understanding how people make choices and where they find um, their partners as they go forward. And certainly partnering, as you've heard from Sophie, is the way most companies uh, are going these days. Um, I think, interestingly, it's grown even from the time I started. So in 2009, the industry average was probably about a third of R&D was already used on outside spend, uh, working with partners. That's now up to about 41, 42%. Um, and it depends. So big companies, less so. Mid-sized pharma, probably more so. Um, so it depends on the type of company. It depends on how they, they work. But critically, it probably depends on how they choose to partner and how they find you. So one of the questions I have for the UK is um, we have, as Jack has well described, some of the best research in the world, no doubt. Uh, some of the highest cited, some exciting research. And yet I'm looking at three years of decline in R&D in my sector in the UK. So our R&D funding has declined from a high watermark of, in 2010 of roughly about 30% of all industrial R&D in the UK to now about 20%. Now, if that was happening worldwide, maybe it's an industry R&D model is broken story, but it's not. Uh, the increase in, in international funding for R&D for pharma is increasing. It always has, but it's not declined. It's gone at a slower rate, but it's not declined. That's telling me that money is going elsewhere, and it may mean that it's just not coming to the UK. So what I'd like to see in the, uh, addition to what Jackie said about government investment is I want us to focus on what we mean by the commons. Um, the commons is always used in knowledge commons in terms of rights. What it ignores is that in that same theory is about an understanding of relationships and engagement. And one thing I think that we really need to work on in the UK is exactly what Sophie described. More events where we bring together our scientists so that they can work together and that we create opportunities for people to go back and forth between academia and industry and much more flexibility. I think that would be the single best thing we could do. So thank you. Thank you. Greg. Yeah, okay, so um, I got asked two questions. Um, the first question was about the academic perspective, the importance of the academic contribution uh, of research and innovation in biotech. And of course, I speak as an academic, so inevitably I'm biased, and that doesn't mean to say that there aren't contributions from others. So I'll try to show the academic uh, contributions particularly important. So if we look at the history of modern biotech, um, I would say it's been heavily based on three technological advances. DNA sequencing, genetic engineering, and mouse hybridomas. We could choose other options, but I think those, in my view, would be the biggest, and I'm willing to argue the case. Now, those technologies were originally developed in academia, and mainly for academic purposes. But they also fueled the biotech revolution. Now, DNA sequencing led to the Human Genome Project and to methods for identifying the genes associated with disease processes from large cohorts of patients. Where did it come from? I guess it came from uh, the fact that DNA had a structure with complementary bases, and there was a genetic code that was solved, and therefore it did seem important if one wants to understand the secret of life, you need to be able to read that, uh, that, uh, uh, the DNA sequence. And that was the reason that Fred Sanger started that work. The second era, genetic engineering, which has led to the production of the first biotech uh, products of insulin, human growth hormone, erythropoietin, etc. Uh, this really came from work on plasmids and antibiotic resistance. Again, origins in academia. 
If you look at mouse hybridoma technology, which led to the creation of precision antibody reagents for diagnostics and also for research, and most especially for identifying the proteins associated with disease processes, where did that came, come from? It came from Cesar Milstein wanting to understand the nature of somatic mutation and having uh, hybridomas at particular points, or ha having, let's say, pure clones at a particular point of the immune response. Now, each of those primary technologies generated its own biotech industry. Um, it wasn't the intention of the original scientists to do that, but it did. And that ranged from DNA sequencing machines to pregnancy testing kits and to novel therapeutics, um, of which I've mentioned there are common insulin and growth hormone, et cetera. Now, what's quite interesting is although the application of each of these what I'll call primary technologies was in, had important and direct applications, I think their application in combination has also been dramatic. So, for example, the combination of mouse hybridoma technology and uh, uh, rapid DNA sequencing has provided systematic and complementary approaches for identifying disease targets. It's got two good methods for doing it. And in fact, for understanding the underlying pathology of disease. And likewise, the uh, contribution of mouse hybridoma technology and genetic engineering allowed the creation of engineered human antibodies for treatment of cancer and autoimmune disease. Now, the availability of disease targets and human antibodies directed against them in turn, triggered a revolution in the pharmaceutical industry, with antibodies now jostling with chemicals as blockbuster drugs. So it's this combination and recombination of discoveries and technologies is what innovation is about. The three primary technologies, DNA sequencing, genetic engineering, mouse hybridoma technologies, rose in academia, but were transferred to industry by publications in the scientific literature or by scientists with know-how moving from or between academia and industry. My own view is that I think academics probably paid, uh, played a, a critical role, and possibly the major role in that, for two reasons. First of all, they were there, they were involved in making the innovations and therefore got first look at it. And the second reason is that there is a greater culture of freedom among academics, so I think are freer to think and play than people in industry who have to get down to producing products and have clearly defined uh, processes. Um, so I think that's why you know, academics have a particularly unique uh, uh, role to play. Um, I asked a second question, which I will sort of partly answer, which is, what are the biggest challenges facing academics in commercializing their research? I think it is reasonable to put the focus on academics um, rather than say, well, actually, uh, they shouldn't bother about it, they should let someone else pick it up and run with it. I mean, they might wish to do that, but I think it's worth asking the question, what can we expect academics to do and what are the challenges they're going to face? And I think there are many challenges in commercializing research, and these range from showing the research is close to application, identifying the size and shape of the market, filing patents, uh, funding, all the way through to developing <coughs> a coherent strategy for commercialization. And don't forget the challenges posed by academic transfer organizations, your own boss, uh, or counterparts in industry, or finding advisors or management with experience and quality to recognize and help commercialize an entirely new field that no one really knows about. Or indeed, you have to recognize that one challenge may be the developing of your own ability to inspire in others a vision of the promised land which you have to have in front of you if you're going to uh, take it forward. Now, I, I encountered all of those challenges and, and more. So expect to be thrown lots of challenges. And the challenges pop up at different stages. And at the time, each has the potential to obstruct successful commercialization. So you just have to get over them. You have to bash your way through all of them. And um, generally, I've tried to use both momentum and kinetic energy, moving fast, and on multiple fronts simultaneously uh, with as much charm as I can muster in the circumstances, which is sometimes taken for rudeness. Um, and I guess it's possible to think of challenges uh, as a giant checklist which need to be ticked off sequentially 
But in my own experience, I think if the vision is inspiring, if you have a clear idea of what it is you're going for and what it is that would excite people, if the science and the proof of concept are focused to that vision, and if the strategy for commercialization matches the vision, then notwithstanding all the other challenges, they've got a reasonable prospect of success. So I think those are the main ones one needs to um, hold on to as an academic. And my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we heard some perspectives, um, the importance of people, the importance of mobility, the importance of the commercial factors. Um, the floor is now open for questions from the audience. Hi, uh, is that on? You can hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks for these interesting insights. My name is Max, PhD student from Germany. I think all of the discussions this morning uh, somewhat revolved around the healthcare sector. When we look at the big picture, how is our life going to change with biotechnology in the decades to come? What other emerging fields, like maybe in or agriculture do you think um, will come up and, and change the life by 2050? Well, I was very fortunate to um, run the, bio, the Biotechnology and Biological <coughs> Sciences Research Council where agriculture and industrial biotechnology sat very squarely in our shop. And I think there are amazing things that will and already are happening in terms of the the life-changing technologies, both in how we can monitor the environment, how we are, will be able to track what happens to our diseases, to crops, etc. But this is where the regulatory environment is also really important, because um, the uh, issues around new technologies for causing genetic manipulations, whether it's inserting material or excising material, are fundamentally uh, underpinning many of the big advances that will happen in biotechnology. Uh, and, and we have to make sure that we have the appropriate regulatory systems to allow that to happen. And I, I think we, we un have underestimated in the past the, the pace of change that will happen as we bring together the digital, you know, I used to talk from <laughs> soil to satellite in terms of agriculture. And it's, it, uh, I, I think it's, it's hard to predict, but the one thing you can predict is that things will fundamentally change. And if we are not creating the environment that allows that change to happen easily within the UK, or indeed Europe, the change will happen elsewhere. Uh, the, the, the analogy I will use is kind of um, container shipping. The UK industry, uh, freight industry, did not embrace container shipping. Container ports all went to Amsterdam and, uh, and Zabuga. And yet container shipping is really important because it sends very standardized packets of data essentially around the world. There's standards. So it's things like standards. It's things like recognizing that we have to embrace change rather than fight it. Just, yeah, I think it's an excellent challenge. Um, the example earlier from antimicrobial resistance, there was the last report of the AMR review team, which was excellent report, I'm sure it'll be the least attended to because it's about everything else, which is if you can handle the water supply a lot better, if you can handle food supply and food uh, distribution a lot better, um, you can contain a lot of the infections that you're trying to correct later in the process. Prevention and that aspect of other, you know, biotech approaching other aspects of life, I think is where prevention may find some real strength. So I'm, I'm excited about it, but I think it's a very good challenge to make. Well, I, I think the problems with agriculture and, uh, and uh, biotech and agriculture is that uh, particularly GM has had a very bad press and made it very difficult for us to see all the uh, very exciting advances that we might see. Um, interestingly enough, that has not been the case with uh, the healthcare sector where all of these antibodies that people are only too happy to put into them Selves, even people who have moral principles, um, have been through GM yeah, approach where they've combined bits of human and mouse and such like. Now, I, I think part of the reason why that we see these two different sectors reflects that quite clearly if you think you are going to die 
otherwise, or you might want a few months longer, then you are willing to, to sacrifice your principles. It's as cynical as that. I think the other attitude, I think the other problem we have is this is a rich world, poor world problem. I think the money is in the, is in the developed world. And frankly, the developed world can always buy more food. It can actually uh, crop out part of Africa. It can do all those things. <coughs> actually, in the developing world, which is where they really need to have the, uh, the novel crops and such like, which all of the possibilities of GM offers, um, they don't have so much money for their development. And I think um, this shows, this is actually unfortunately part of an asymmetry um, that is regrettable. And hopefully one day that will get solved. Right. Uh, another question? Yeah, I think you make an important point about that kind of proximity of the effect. Yeah. Hi, my name is Raphael. Uh, I work as a strategy consultant at Monitor Deloitte in London. My question is, can you name a specific instant of a public-private partnership, or with academia as well, that has been successful? And what do you think it was that made this so unique and so different? My view is the, the Innovative Medicines Initiative was a big public-private partnership. It was a two billion euro public-private partnership and there is a second round now in the Horizon 2020. It was funded under Framework 7 between the pharmaceutical industry and academia, the commission, etc. Why was it successful? It had very clear IP guidelines. People not only put money, companies had to put their contribution was in kind. So it drove a different type of collaborative behavior and it was focused, it caused people to be focused on problems that were of long-term interest to both the companies and the other participants. Yeah, and obviously that's the, the uh, big one that I'm sure most people would refer to in the UK. I think um, what's interesting to me is some of the work that's happened through Innovate UK. Uh, I think some of the work that they uh, progress with around regenerative medicine has been uh, pretty fundamental in really underpinning uh, the, the strong uh, sector we have now developing in the UK. It's now uh, being guided by the cell and gene therapy catapult. Um, it's important that that continues to get support uh, from the government. Uh, mm -hmm. We need two sides on that story, but the, the collaboration, I think, worked there because um, it was genuinely, um, it, it, there was a win-win on, on all sides that was being uh, seen uh, potential for both. And we're trying to look at that now with respect to manufacturing. So can we do the same thing uh, around advanced therapies in manufacturing as well? So could this be a place where the UK can find strength again in manufacturing medicines? Great. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that th th this isn't really um, the answer to your question, but um, I think we need to bear in mind there are a variety of different shapes of public-private partnerships of which some of these big initiatives um, represent a, a major form. Um, but I don't think we should forget about other forms for example, if I think about Cambridge Antibody, a company I set up, um, this involved the Medical Research Council <coughs> who put in uh, the intellectual property um, and had an equity stake and a royalty uh, based on the, um, on the intellectual property they put in. Um, I was allowed to continue to use the laboratory for a couple of years to host researchers from industry, and in the end, we moved out. So that is a form of public-private partnership and those work. The other kind of public-private partnership, which I think, um, I hope will work, is, um, is effectively investment in such things as incubators. So Trinity College is setting up an incubator on Cambridge Science Park for small companies, and the total cost of that is probably going to be, in the end, about 20 million pounds but we obtained a grant from government for that of five million. So again, probably we wouldn't have done that um, had it not been for the fact that effectively we can use that money to help us deal with some of the commercial uncertainties of running such an incubator. And I think so there are ways in which the public and private sector can get together and uh, do more than they would individually. Okay, well I think our time is up. Um.
<coughs> so I'd like to thank our yeah. panelists thank you. Okay. for a very stimulating discussion. And we've now got the um, showcases uh, of uh, res research and innovation showcase. So I'm not sure how is it going to work. Well, are we going to pull them up to the podium or are we going to remain here or? <laughs> Okay. Right, okay, <laughs> fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.